that have specs that say, hey, if you have data in between like these two certain like note tags or they're after this end tag or something like that, it just ignores them entirely. So a image viewer will go through to the end, see the PNG, you know, the I end uh, tag and say, all right, that's the end of it. We're just going to display what we've found and ignore that there's several megabytes of secret, you know, zip file appended to the end of it or something, which you only find if you look for magic bits somewhere within the file. So the demo for this one is a file called uh, stallman.png. Um, this is included in the directory. If you try to open it, um, it will open just fine. It will show you the PDF as it's supposed to, or the, not the PDF, the PNG as it's supposed to. But if you run, in this case, I'll do foremost on it. Whoops. I didn't even know you could make type. That's okay, that terminal doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I don't think you do that either. Practice run, yes, okay. If you run foremost on it, what? Oh yeah, if there's an output directory, it'll freak out. Kill your existing output directory. What, what the fuck? Okay, that's... Sir. It's gonna pretend that's not Live going on. demos, everybody. This always goes well. So anyways, as the demo has started two seconds ago and nothing's happened yet, I'll run foremost on the program, and this will create a folder called uh, output. And when you see that, it will give you a nice audit file which says that there are uh, two, in this case, files and two PNGs in here. So we can then go into the... What's important, look, so this first one, the 000 PNG, the file offset is zero. This is the original file that you saw going from the beginning to you know, the end tag. This file offset is saying you know, that's where the second PNG was just kind of slapped onto the end of it and you know, foremost found it, but your image viewers would not. So, and then it outputs the two PNGs, and if you open up the, uh, the new one, we can see that we find our flag right that. Literal CTF classic always comes up as the 100 point file forensics play around steganography something or other, because it's fun. A lot, a lot of garbage. It'll show out. It'll show you any uh, strings that are hard coded into the program, which is kind of nice. Um, but it'll show you a lot of just like, hey, we found these 16 bytes in a row that technically form printable characters, except it's like you know a bunch of carrots and dollar signs, just nonsense, just kind of smushed together. Um, you know, piping this into grep and looking for like, a certain word or, you know, flag or CDC or CTF or something like that is usually your best bet to find what's actually yeah. important. Right, so to demo this one, uh, I'm going to run the strings on the file uh, track 01 to mp3. And this one's just going to be fine. So it's going to print out a lot of info. And I could just scroll through all this for a very, very long time, which I won't do. Lots of, you know, oh, so something you could do to um, speed the process up is to do a strings is to look for strings of length let's say like ten and then it's a much much quicker to scroll through this whole thing and I'm back to the top basically already and then here we can find the flag and then another way of doing it quicker is since if we know that the flag is going to be formatted with ISG at the beginning we can just grip grip for ISG and then that'll print out one line and that makes it a lot easier if, if you know the format as well. All right, uh, you can take this one. This is, so the same <laughs> magic bits that we've been talking about for some <laughs> amount of time. Uh, is this going to be Moody's thing? Um, I didn't do any Moody's stuff. Like cool. if a file's corrupted, basically. Cool. Um, so magic bits, the you know, Unix lakes, like we said, will rely on those instead of the file extension. But if you mess around with those, then that's the equivalent of screwing with the uh, you know file extension on a Windows box. Uh, things will freak out and not know exactly how to open it. There are some programs where you can just say, hey, ignore magic bit stuff. I'm just going to throw data at you and just try and parse it as a zip or an image or a tarball or whatever the hell. But in general, uh, your best bet is to 
you know, if you can figure out what's up with it, you can uh, fix or play with the magic bits. This is something that's come up before, but you'll get a, a binary that has the magic bits flipped in some way, so it doesn't execute, and you can't, you know, run this program to spit out the, the string. But if you go in and look, you'll see, oh, you know, they, they literally just flipped one bit in here. We can change that in the hex editor, like you're going to see, and then suddenly it'll understand how to run it, and things will be good again. Um, you're not going to see that, actually, because I don't have a demo for this one. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, trust me on this. Um, yeah. Hey, has Ice Age published Moody's um, naughty gnome anomaly <laughs> from Nationals? You can still download it from iScore. We can still download it. For their benefit. I guess like, like, you want us just leaking as anomalies that haven't been... We did. Solved I solved it. I did, yeah, oh. we, like, we solved it oh. like fast. And then a bunch of us solved it fast. Later. Cool. Uh, so that'll be one to look at. Just open this, the binary that'll be distributed in a hex editor like Bless alongside uh, a known good binary and look at the first couple bytes of it and you'll see, oh, this one bit just got flipped. We changed the seven to a five and things <laughs> magically work again. Right, so that's kind of like a, for any sort of file. Now it's going to do some stuff that's specific to if you know you're working with an image. Um, this is kind of into the field of steganography, which the idea behind steganography is that you are hiding a message so that you don't, it's not clear the message is even being sent. Like with crypto, you're still sending a message, but people know you're sending a message. Steganography is trying to hide the fact that you're actually even sending a message to begin with. Um, it's kind of a bit of a lost start right now since crypto is good and you don't need to hide the fact that you're sending messages anymore, but maybe with quantum computing being scary, people will decide stego is important again. Um, so one really popular stego technique is called a LSB encoding or least significant bit. The idea here is that in every single pixel of an image, you have 255 red, green, and blue values. So every single pixel can have 16 million different possible colors in the one tiny pixel. And if you just changed one of those values by a tiny bit, so like instead of a pixel value being 00FF00, it was 00FE00, your eye wouldn't be able to really detect that change. So in this case, you're changing the least significant green bit, so it goes from 255 to 254. And you can use these um, least significant bits to spell out a message in binary. Um, you can use this to hide either a string or use it to hide an image. Strings obviously don't take up as much space. An image would probably be a bit bigger. Um, two demos for this one. I'll demo bit plane first. Um, this is one where you're hiding an image in a bit plane. Um, for detecting steganography, um, there's kind of a sort of Swiss army knife tool that's really popular called a stegsolve.jar. So I'll just load that one up. This was included in the file. Um, this is really useful, but that is very tiny text. Um, yeah. Uh, basically just opening up the file in stegsolve. This is also a very tiny picture, but... <laughs> Um, from here, you can kind of just flip through with different panes of an image. Like you can, in this case, it's color inverted. Um, I'll skip to the important stuff. So um, this is, um, in this case, red pane number seven. So this is the most significant bit of the file. And in this case, it, the first few bits look like the image. As you start going down, it gets like, a bit more blurry as there's uh, more randomness, I guess, in, those, in the picture. But if we get to a red pane number one, or red pane zero, you'll see it's now actually a completely different image. And the contrast is terrible, and the image is small, so you can't actually read that, but that is displaying a flag. Yes. Do you know when you can expand on the bigger? We can certainly try. No. <laughs> <laughs> can you zoom in on this, though, like control and whoosh? You would think so. Control. I've, this I've tried. This is not new. I don't know how long ago it was published, but I know it's certainly not new. Yeah, it's old, it's an old but a goodie, I guess. It's like a kilobyte in size, probably. This so it's actually planned, so now you have to go do this on your own. <laughs> um, this tool is also distributed in the, in the directory in Slack. Yeah, I posted this with the other demos. If um, you don't trust us, then like just Google stakes all that yes. jar and get it from the creator. Um, all right, so continuing with the demos that you can't actually see. Um, to, that's how you display it or hide an image, but you can also just hide text, and that kind of looks a little bit different. So this one is a low sodium bagel. Okay, this is actually a bigger image. And then if you just, again, skip to, um, in this case, red pane zero again. At the very bottom, this is hard to see, but the, literally the very, very bottom, there's a little line where it's kind of, again, I can't zoom in, but it's just kind of black and white dots. Uh, there's text there, we swear. Yes. If if this was just like, what? I'm just trying to see if I can. Oh no, see it's, that it's on not here. text. It's yeah. literally just dots. Oh, it's dots. It's spell, it's, it spells out in binary. 
It's, it's the idea. Here. There's dots there, we swear. So if you wanted to extract the binary string, you could go to um, Analyze and Data Extract, if that wants to load. Cool. Right, OK, it did. Mode. And then from here, you just choose to extract um, the zero bit plane and hit um, Preview. And at the bottom, we can kind of see that in the sea of just FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
because again, strings exist, and most of the time, I you would find stuff with strings if they've done something weird where it's like like the, the like there's one byte at the beginning of each of the exif tags or something, and strings wouldn't catch it. I don't know. That could be a thing, but yes. So that'd be a silly question. Do videos have any kind of tags like that as well, or is it just? Video? I would have yeah. to. I would imagine yes. Um, so like in Windows, if you right click on a file, um, go to like properties and then details or something, that's usually where you see it. Otherwise on like Linux, I know GNOME um, just shows you an image finder. Yeah, the image default viewers. image viewers on a lot on GNOME, yeah. and I think it's just the bad data that you see there. And if the image is keeping track of it, you'll sometimes actually see like <laughs> GPS coordinates from like a phone or something. Yeah. The vast majority of the time, it's just going to show you, hey, here's the resolution of the photo, and maybe like one tag of like the website that you grabbed it from, if the website cares about sticking their name into images that people are downloading. But um, yeah, fun can be had. Find a smartphone, see if maybe it is sticking GPS coordinates in there or something. All right, so another tool for detecting steganography, really common one, is called a steg hide. And the idea here is that it's basically just you embed a message or an image, but instead of doing it like, kind of like all in a row, it kind of scatters around like what bits it's in, so it's harder to detect. So to extract um, the data from a file that has been encoded with steg hide, just run the command steg hide extract sf on the file, and then it'll ask you for a password. Uh, most of the times in a CTF, the password is just blank, which is an option, and that will print out um, what the flag is. Ideally. Um, so for the low sodium bagel example, the reason we couldn't extract the string when we did the file extraction is because it was encoded with stake hide. So to decode it, just run the command. And then it'll ask you for a passphrase, then just hit enter. And it'll print out what it finds to a file. Typing is hard. And that will print out the flag in this case. So pretty straightforward, kind of an easy thing to just like try randomly and see if it works. There is similar to, st so Steghide has a limited number of file types that it can work with because it is playing fun games with, you know, least significant bits steganography. Um, uh, there are other tools out there that will do the same kind of thing with other file types. I know Deep Sound is one that I really like for playing with MP3 files. Uh, specifically, I think it only works with MP3s. It might have a couple other sound options. But uh, if you've seen season one of Mr. Robot, that's the one that's used to hide data onto CDs that are then burned and stuck in binders. And yeah, that's, uh, they got that one right, which is <laughs> fun. Um, I think they got the most of it right, yeah. real. But uh, yeah, st Deep Sound and Steg Hide are two very fun things that, uh, Deep Sound doesn't show up in CTFs as often or ever, but they're fun <laughs> tools to have if you want to be really paranoid and hide your you know, password manager database somewhere to feel like a mystery. All right, so that's kind of it for images, but um, for audio files, there's a few other things you kind of want to do, see if there's some sort of message in the audio. Um, one thing that you can do is you kind of view the audio in a spectrogram. Uh, this is a different way of, I guess, viewing an audio file visually. Um, the idea here is that it kind of displays the frequencies going on in the audio file. You, there are special tools you can use to write a message so that it is hidden in the spectrogram. Um, if you do this, then the audio file isn't going to like sound natural, so it's kind of a bit of a giveaway that there's something going on in that sense. Um, Audacity is a good tool for visualizing uh, spectrograms. Uh, there's another one that I was going to say, but I forgot the name of it. But I think there's some web tools that'll just let you visualize spectrograms. Yeah. Um, do I have Audacity? Yeah, yes, I do. So uh, I'm going to be doing this on uh, Puzzle 3. Again, download Audacity not only because it's good for playing with this puzzle, but it's just a useful tool to keep yes. around. All right. So um, default view doesn't really show anything. Um, can I zoom in on the? No, it doesn't help. That's actually probably gonna make things worse. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but the drop-down arrow that I'm currently hovering over, if you open that menu, gives you an option to um, determine the view. By default, it's on the waveform. Um, two below that is the spectrogram. And if we go to that, <coughs> you can see, <coughs> sorry, there's the flag for that one. If you look up uh, Doom soundtrack spectrogram, you'll also find some fun things from where the audio engineers for the 2016 Doom video game hid, I think, pentagrams, like 666s six, six, <laughs> and stuff like that in the spectrogram of their sound files, which is pretty awesome. 
Uh, you can take this one. I don't have a demo. All right, Morse code. Hands up if you know what that is. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, this, okay, cool. Morse code. Lots of fun. No law. It's uh, what's its claim to fame? No longer required for your amateur radio license. So that's fun. Um, no one has to learn it anymore, but you, you, you should because it's fun. My confession is I tried to learn it and just didn't stick with my practice and just suck at it. Um, but it, this kind of thing likes to show up in uh, CTFs pretty frequently. Uh, now. Sometimes it's as simple as you're just handed an MP3 that has, you know, dots and dashes in it and there's just lots of beeps and you just run it through a Morse code decoder. Sometimes it's like a visual thing with 90% of the time you're just finding a hidden audio file that has sounds, like a, that has Morse code sounds and you might have to play with uh, the speed it plays at or something, but just run it through Morse code decoders. There are popular applications on the Play Store and on the uh, iOS App Store and also just lots of places online where you can say Morse code, encode, decode, whatever, and it'll uh, let you find out what is hidden inside the dots and dashes. All right. I have a feeling you want to talk about this one, but... All right. Uh, wait, are we going to get do this demo? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, so DTMF, here's the, the next audio one. Who knows what DTMF tones are? Awesome. Cool. So this one is... Uh, if you ever push the keypad buttons on a phone and you've heard uh, the different sounds they make, those are the dual tone multi-frequency uh, tones. They, if you look them up on Wikipedia, you can see that they are uh, made up of two waveforms, play, or two just sine waves that are <coughs> overlaid on top of each other. And the way they do that is they actually just map a grid across the keypad. And they have, you know, sine, like four different sine waves going top to bottom and three different sine waves going left to right. And you just find the intersection, mash those two over top of each other, and you get the weird kind of dissonant tone. Um, these are somewhat popular in CTFs because there's something that people hear that and you recognize it and you go, I, this, this sounds familiar to me. Um, and they are just in general a fun way of encoding numbers and or letters. If people are doing it with letters, it's usually just the way that, um, you know, you text it with a you know, real vintage cell phone at this point. You gotta hit, you know, the one button, or the two button twice in order to send a B, and three times to send a C, and whatever. Um, they, they'll just have a string of numbers, which if you turn them into letters, you'll end up with some flag matching the format. You know, CTF, this is the flag. Um, demo. Yes, so um, going off again what he said about the whole pressing buttons multiple times is for texting purposes. Um, there are plenty of websites online for detecting DTMF tones. This is like the first like, one that I Googled. Um, again, just upload a file, and it should uh, print out the contents of it. So but with this one, hopefully it works. I think it works like every other time. It prints out in order the tones it hears. So it hears, um, first it hears a 4 4 f I'll zoom in. So here's 444 four, seven, 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 seven to start off. And if you look at like a phone keypad, <coughs> that couldn't be any smaller, but whatever. So 444 four, four spells out I, um, and 2 is A, and then 777 seven, seven is S, and then after that was probably another 4, so that's ISG, and that gets the flag format, so that's kind of good starting on the right track. And just keep going with that, and you should get the whole flag. Um, Fun practical implication DTMF tones, if I could find the slides again. Um, at the DEF CON Social Engineering CTF, uh, the kind of, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. Right. So um, DEF CON Social Engineering captured the flag. Uh, we've talked about it before, but long story short, one person does a bunch of research on a company, they sit in a booth, they call, they make calls to this company and try and elicit information out of employees without their knowledge. It's not asking for passwords or anything sensitive, just trying to get them to talk about like their antivirus or their IT logistics providers and stuff like that. Um, but they are put in a soundproof booth where they have a phone that is connected to speakers that the room can hear so that they don't hear the, the audience. But also, they found some way to wire it such that it doesn't violate Nevada's wiretapping laws. Because if they had like a phone, because the phone doesn't technically exist in the booth, the phone exists <laughs> outside the booth. But then there's wires to the microphone and headphones in there, and like they they have lawyers that know how to make it not a violation of two-party consent wiretapping laws. So that's kind of fun. But for years, when they have uh, when competitors have asked them to call the next number on their list. They will start punching numbers into the phone, which, you know, because if you are punch numbers into a phone, you can hear the tones as you type them in. And some enterprising young miscreants in the audience started recording those tones, sent them through a 
uh, tone uh, you know, decoder and then went up to the organizers of the competition after and said, hey, so I have like all of the numbers for Smith & Wesson's internal hotline stuff that you were just calling. That's kind of fun, isn't it? So they had to change the rule midway through the competition. Or they changed their way of doing it midway through the competition because they didn't want people to know like the direct lines to executives of various firearm companies. <laughs> that could lead to problems. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's the literal one use case of DTF tones being used like a, a fun real world thing outside of CTFs or obviously like phone and radio communications. Yes? My favorite uh, CDC use of DTF uh, tones was in high school, it was my sophomore year, and there was an anomaly, no one could figure it out. Mm -hmm. for beeps and like whatever. And then somebody got the bright idea to turn up their speakers and hold a phone. <laughs> Hold the CDC phone to the speaker and then like, dial that they picked up and they're like, oh, it didn't work, and then they start talking the flag out. <laughs> By far the best use I've ever seen. Like, we didn't think about going and doing that. But. Wacker, was that you? Wacker was oh, probably not. But it sounds like either you or Dre That was either me or Dre host thing. And, you know, that that's, was that's fun. But not like. <laughs> I, I think the design of that was more that you figure out the numbers and then you call it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, like, call it. The way the <coughs> system works, it just yeah. plays the tone. <laughs> and the server is just like, oh, well, I mean, you call this number because I heard the tone. It's like, <laughs> you dial it. Yeah. yeah. That's fun. Yeah. So phone freaking is not completely dead. It's still got exactly one use case, I guess. All right. So um, final main category is this archive files. Um, anything that's kind of compressed, I guess, could be another word for it. Um, the first one that's kind of popular is you just can compress a file about like 20 different times. And then it's up to the blue teamers to kind of figure out a way to quickly unzip or decompress it all, figure out the exact commands, install what they need to, et cetera. It can be kind of annoying. The A tier, that's not right. Okay. Sometimes it is, yes, just repeatedly clicking yes. the XDG open, 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 open. Yeah. But there is a better way, yeah. as we right. will see in approximately yeah. five seconds. And the command not called ATRX, it's actually called DTRX. Yeah, oh, you cold. <laughs> I, def I, <clears throat> I definitely did not make these slides um, today. Yeah. Um, DTRX, it is not a standard tool on Linux installations. However, comma, it is in community repositories. I know it's in the Ubuntu repos. I know it's in the Arch community repo. And if it's in those two, that means it's everywhere. It's mainstream, so deal with it. Uh, but it stands for do the right extraction. It is a wonderful tool that makes it so you never have to remember a tar flag again. You just point it at an archive file and say, do the right extraction. And it will just do the right extraction and give you the resulting files. It also has a wonderful feature that you're about to see in which it says, this contains a file, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, just keep going, go past it. This is uh, just prompting you about name stuff. Now, it'll say, hey, so this long file name with lots of, you know, it's, it's some crazy number of archives and compressions on top of each other. It contains another archive file. Uh, do you want us to just, uh, where is it? Always. Um, extract Wait. all of the included archives. Uh, you can just say, go down the entire rabbit hole and spit out whatever comes out at the bottom. And it will magically you know, just spit out a bunch of stuff. Hey. Which, where was the end one? Where's folder? Not, uh, where's folder? I definitely forgot what, it, um, what the end name of this one is. Excellent. Uh, oh, it's WTF. Is, is, is this one no, WTF page? is something else. Oh, I, uh, Okay. Anyways, I got at the very least, I got us most of the way there. Well, long story short, if we knew what the hell we were doing, it would go all the way down the rabbit hole and spit out whatever the final file was at the very end. Running it twice got it to work, I guess. Neat. Yeah. <laughs> In new folder, from there we can just cut out the flag, and yeah. instead of having to dig through like 18 man pages, just run a command twice. This is something that shows up in a lot of CTFs in various forms and fashions. It's, if you look up the term, I think they call them like file matroshka or whatever, the Russian nesting doll thing is the, the joke. Um, we definitely, for the last Halloween CTF, one of the puzzles was I just wrote a script that picked random tar operations and just kept making the tar ball larger and larger and larger until there was something like 500 layers of random tar archives and seven zips and nonsense going on, which funnily enough makes the file like 50 times larger than the original. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, yeah, you could just sit there and keep clicking the yes, keep going, keep going, or write a script of your own or just throw a tool like this. Yeah. Is. Um, which is fun and good and has like zero real world app, like practicality because again, nobody runs that many levels of 
like archive files on something. But it's fun. Or if you're just forgetting how to run tar commands again, because yeah. that's a common thing. It's not that hard, but okay. I mean, I don't think it is, I but it's not I hard. I die on the tar is not that hard, so box, but whatever. I mean, okay. All right, so another thing that you can see is an archive that is in some way damaged, and that maybe it's just like missing data or something. And if it is damaged, then most of the time it won't extract by default. It will say, I don't want to extract this, it's damaged, I quit. Um, but you can use switches to force extraction. It depends on exactly what compression algorithm is being used. But in that case, it will extract the partial data that you have, and that partial data might just be enough. It might be complete files, and maybe like some files are garbage. And in that case, it might just be all you need. Everything out of this one? Not really. This is just kind of like what I was saying earlier. That there's some programs in Linux where you can just say, "Hey, I know magic bits don't work. I know this looks wrong. Just do your best. Just I'm, take this data and do your operation on it." And a lot of the time, it'll just say, "Yeah, no, it's broken beyond repair." But sometimes uh, you can actually just convince it, ignore the magic bits, ignore the fact that it's missing this signature at the end of the file, just spit out whatever you can find, and it'll work. All right, and then a little bit of encryption stuff. Um, some common encryptions they might run into. Um, Caesar cipher, this is probably the most popular like, basic encryption. The idea here is that you kind of have a key, which is number between 1 and 25, and you use that key to shift the letters in the string by that many characters. So if like, you have a C, D, C as your beginning string, and you have a key of 1, it would shift to D, E, D. Um, you can just kind of guess that something that's cipher and this quickly brute force it. There's only 25 combinations, so just like running through all the possible combinations isn't going to take you too long. Another popular one is the Bacon cipher, and this is basically not really a cipher as much as kind of like binary, but for letters. Um, it's five bits. Um, the idea here is that A is zero and B is one, so the letter A would be A A A A A, and then B would be A A A B, C would be A A A B A, and go on, go on, go on. Um, as an example, this is how you would encode hello in the Bacon Cipher. This one is pretty straightforward to spot, and you can just kind of decode it that about just as straightforwardly. Um, for any sort of simple encryption thing that you're going to run into, great tool that's useful called CyberChef. If you just Google CyberChef, it'll come up. And we'll go into, to, go into that more on the second slide, if you yeah, uh, Basically, literally at any point in the CTF, if you ever see uh, strings of A's and B's, or sometimes it'll be zeros and ones, but they'll be broken up into chunks of size five instead of eight. Um, that is usually, a, it's almost always A's and B's. That's a pretty good indication that you just want to copy and paste it into some Baconian cipher decoder and just look at whatever comes out. Right. Uh, another kind of straightforward one is um, for simple encoding challenges. Um, basically here is you just have a string and they've encoded it in some other encoding other than ASCII. Um, most popular ones probably like binary, which is base two, and hexadecimal, which is base 16. Um, another one that you'll see pretty often is base 64. Uh, base 64 is base 64, or yeah, it's in the name. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Um, six bits is what I'm trying to say per character. Uh, so the alphabet for that, um, encoding is all the letters, capital and lowercase, uh, all the digits, and then the plus sign, and I think the backslash is the other one? It depends on the, yeah. yeah. If, if you ever want to see a good use case for why Base64 exists and is something you need to know about, Tom Scott has a great video on, I think it's called Will YouTube Ever Run Out of Video IDs or something like that? And you just, yeah, it's a, like seven minutes of explaining why Base64 is both magical and perfect for their use case and just in general a very useful thing when you're dealing with serializing in immense number of objects in some sort of database. Yeah. And if you did code a string and you think you did everything right, but you're still getting some sort of like garbage looking outputs, it might have decoded to a file. In that case, you just want to download it, run file on it, and then continue as normal from there. Also, don't do what shows up on Twitter every now and then where someone will say, hey, so here's this like secret key of some kind that this company is Hit, like baked into their product or it's stored in a cookie or something and the crypto on it is literally just base 64. Don't do that. Illegal. Never don't trust base 64 as like some way of actually obfuscating data because everyone knows that you can just decode base 64 and get the results like nothing. This is rare but it happens. Don't do it. Right, so quick down for this one is the file encoded txt. Um, this one is what I click on. Oh, okay. Um, so that's clearly a binary string. Um, if imported from here into CyberChef, this is what CyberChef looks like. I don't know if I can really zoom in too well. Okay, I can. So got a binary string. Um, here's our input, and then here's output from doing absolutely nothing. So if we want to decode from binary, just search for like from 
from binary, and then that'll decode it. And in this case, it decodes, but it doesn't decode to um, clear text. In this case, it's actually decoding to octal, which is um, 0 through 7. It's base 8. So we want to just decode it again. In this case, do from octal. And this decodes to, we will recognize more hexadecimal, 0 through 9, and then A through F. And then from there, this is what basically 64 looks like if you haven't seen it before. Usually there will be one or two equal signs at the end, depending on um, how many bits are in the string. But then this should be the last one. This is decode from base 64. And then there's our flag. And then if also, Cyber stuff's really nice and it'll hold your hand for you if you really want it to. Um, this little magic wand icon next to the output will kind of tell you what it thinks you should do. So it'll say, hey, you should decode this from binary. Okay. Hey, you should decode this from octal. Okay. Decode the, oh, from octal and from hex. Okay. And then decode from base 64 and then there's your flag. So this one will <laughs> literally hold your hand through the whole process if you want it to. CyberChef is maybe the single most useful tool for CTFs and just general file format nonsense of any kind ever. Uh, like literally indispensable for every CTF I've ever done, plus just general work on stuff. If you don't want to, you know, if you aren't comfortable with playing with command line stuff for moving, for, uh, you know, hex encoding and base 64 decoding and all that, just being able to throw it in there and click the magic wand until stuff works is really nice. All right, so to real. Makes a lot of work. Yeah, it's it's really nice. Um, to real quick demo, um, what happens with decode to a file, for example. Um, in this case, for input, it's just a long base64 string, and then when we decode it from base64, assuming this works right, it looks like garbage, but like if you scroll through it here, it doesn't really decode anything. But at the very top, you'll see uh, JFIF, which is the magic bits for a JPEG image, which is kind of a hint that it might be a file. Even if you don't notice that, it's not too bad to check. From there, you can just run a save output to file. Um, by default, it will give the name of download.dat. So we'll save that. Um, the download thing actually tells you it's a JPEG, so that can save you a step there. Um, but if we did save that, and then uh, file, uh, if we run file on it after downloading it, it will say it's a JPEG. So that's kind of a good demo of like what happens if you're given a file that's been encoded with this into a string. I think that's the last, I cannot into. Okay, that's the last slide. Are there any questions about any of that? All right, thanks everybody.